Hello and most welcome to 12.52 and see if I can summon certain parts of the conundrum here. The conundrum is that there are unanswered questions hidden in the present physics and uh, Roberto Berger and Lee Smolen puts focus on this, put the, our attention to these things, makes us aware of them. And this is the reason for this painstakingly long lecture series. And also it's the reason for this book being so extensive. It's repetition, but it's also the most elongated explanation of very few things I ever come across, but necessary so. Nobody would have access to the understanding of these things without that prolonged explanation. And I've been reading the reviews of the book and there are many scientists, uh, journalists of scientists, science, and other well scholared people that says and writes that there is something interesting with the book or astonishing but they cannot make full sense of it so we are in good company here and i struggle myself but some things can actually be extracted so far already i'm already uh, understood that there are unanswered questions. Why these laws of nature? They have never ever been questioned until now, I would say, until I read this book. Initial conditions is another thing. This has been brought up before, especially by Julian Barber. There is no coincidence that Julian Barber and Lee Smolin cooperated. But in the hands of Roberto Mangueira and uh, Roberto Mangueira Unger and Lee Smoling, it becomes much clearer how incredibly, how it is just astonishing that this question is never answered. It is an incredibly important question to answer. And I would say this is worse. Uh, than my often made quote that Newton never got back to time in the Principia. He mentioned it in, a, in the preamble to Principia that he wrote later, but he never gets back to it in Principia. Not once. C.S. Peirce, uh, the American philosopher of, uh, of class, I would say, to suppose universal laws of nature capable of being apprehended by the mind, this is important, and yet having no reason for their special forms, but standing inexplicable and irrational, is hardly a justifiable position. Uniformities are precisely the sort of facts that need to be accounted for. Law is par excellence the thing that wants a reason. This is similar to how often in a sharp manner Julian Barber, the very mild-sensed uh, British landlord, I would say, if that's correct, uh, gentleman, he sharpens up that the two body body uh, three body problem has been ignored when you read physics when i did it it was ignored it was quickly jumped over in this saltation the most problematic thing was thereby ignored and that was not intentionally made which makes it so much worse and then you get the feeling it's part of experience that 
you can't you don't have the possibility of sensing that somebody made that fault or intentionally tricked you because in every trickery or every fault there is a person behind usually in almost all cases and I think that makes it easier to figure out you see certain traits of there being somebody behind it in these cases there is no one behind it and that is part of why it hides so well it is part of your reality which you grow up in there's no doubt about that it is definitely not part of your verbal explanations because these things never got any verbal explanations but they are part of your experience the sense that the laws are unchanging and permanent and that there is a possibility of having initial conditions outside of our universe. I took the liberty to ask a lot of people what do they think about having initial conditions and I would say none of them found it problematic. I didn't either before I read the book. We are incredibly used to this and so were our fathers and their fathers and their fathers going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, I'd say. Definitely more consolidated with Sir Isaac Newton, but it, was, it, it has always been here. Yes, I know the laws of the Greek were not as cut in stone. I think this is a good example. I just remember now, I was amazed when I first heard that the Greeks didn't think that the laws of nature were cut in stone, that they were, they did not think that the laws of nature were infallible. And I was astonished. And I remained so for quite some time. But now I realize they are more right than I ever was. Why would they be unchangeable? Why is that so incredibly, as we would say in Sweden, självklart, self-evident doesn't have the same ring? Well, it's because nobody talked about this ever. And what is not talked about is part of perception. And we know from Edward de Bono, perception is almost impossible to disagree with. How could you? Once you go into the verbal sphere of your mind, where can you find these things? You cannot, because it's not part of your verbal curriculum or library. It is not spoken. And I think this must be considerably worsened in modern times. Because there are today so much, many more people being exposed to education and similarly as was in the case of Julian Barber, the free body problem was overstepped, never mentioned or so briefly mentioned with no explanation, then you get used to it. This that example with Julian Barber, that was in physics. This doesn't only pertain to physics, it's all over the place. Everyone has that. I would say that even small school children, if they are of the age more than 12, they would think or have at least a vague idea that the, uh, the laws of the universe, the physical laws of the universe are permanent, unchangeable. And this is the battle that Rupert Sheldrake been living in his whole life. Because his theory of structural metamorphosis and structural cell forms in the universe of course goes against the grain 
of this thinking. I would say it becomes very problematic. And uh, Roberto Unger, he goes against it because in his own field of study, his own fields, it is questioned constantly. It used to be the case in his fields that there were thought to be laws in economics and in social sciences. The most famous one being the, that one from Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. There were laws of economy. And of course, it is easier to understand. It took a while still, but to understand that that is not even possible. But still, the whole of Soviet Union and China believe that there were laws of economy. So, once you can get fooled into something that's so obviously wrong, this is so much less obviously wrong, uh, and at start it doesn't seem like a question at all. We need to be helped here, I think. I need to add didactic tools, and the first one I will add, and I will get back to that in a later lecture, is that space, we know, I talked about that before, Space comes in discrete portions. It doesn't, it's not linear. It's not continuous. So why would time and space in the Newtonian concept be linear and discontinuous? This, uh, uh, continuous. You can, I think you probably can see that there would be a problem already with this. If space comes in discrete portions, how can there be permanent laws? And how can there be initial conditions? To get a sense of it, don't overthink it in the beginning. Once you get used to it, you can put your thinking power more, more strongly into it. And I think this should be compared how Jacques Derrida, for instance, uh, uncovered uh, the hidden, unverbalized trait of logocentrism in all the texts that he went through. I think that's a similar trait. I think he did a little bit what Lee Smolin and Roberto Unger is doing now. Although they were attacking something much more uh, it's bigger, it goes in all areas, so it, it covers everything. I'll continue with the text because I think that's the best way. I know it is strugglesome and tedious, but this is the way it shines through in the end. It cannot be summarized. Yes, I've been trying to do that. The reason for that is of pedagogical reasons once more. I think it will motivate you and to persevere in the idea of understanding this. And I think it's a fun thing that this is also shared by Zabina Hosenfelder, who thinks it's absolutely ridiculous that, for instance, what Max Tegmark says, we are mathematical beings. What is it to be a mathematical creature? What would it be that the universe is mathematical, or the chair here is mathematical? It doesn't make any sense if you're going to be really honest. It's like we, we, we've been walking around in a world where everyone is nude and all the institutions are nude. And just because we got used to perceiving nudity, nudity as a fully dressed institution or claim or proposition or a person, we can no longer see it. It needs a great innovative thinker like Blaise Morgan and, of course, Roberto Unger. It is just amazing. And I'm pretty sure these people will never ever get the Nobel Prize. 
not because their, uh, their discovery or their understanding, whatever you call it, isn't great. It's possibly the, most, the greatest thing I ever went so far. It beats Julian Barber. They go further than Julian Barber. I don't see whom it would make sense to. I clearly doubt that the people in the committee at NOBO would understand this. I don't know. It sounds preposterous for me, but the struggle I've been having with this is, is the same. Now, vaguely, I can begin to explain it. And I will add and draw in, because into this, all different philosophers that we pass through can be drawn in and made stronger. This is a strength in it. This doesn't exclude anything of, of, uh, of the 1200 episodes before. On the contrary, it will make them much stronger. This will help Heidegger. And uh, I would say this will make the promise that Graham Priest sort of did to me that uh, paraconsistent logic could help the understanding of what Heidegger wanted to mean but couldn't express. It didn't work for me that way because I was lacking information or help. Now I got it. I'm incredibly thankful for that. It's, uh, it's a boon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too much almost. First, uh, the Nobel Prize. And now this Nobel Prize to free renowned quantum physicists. And now on top of that, I also get this. Uh, I've been rewarded more than uh, I could ever hope for. This will make it possible to explain quantum mechanics without a hinge of mathematics. Not even referring to it, not having to make a summary of it, or not having to explain it in another way. It makes due with that. It goes to the core problem. It goes to why we don't understand quantum mechanics, because once this is is not taken into the air. When this is not exposed, you don't have any possibility of understanding quantum mechanics. But whereas it's put into, out of hiding, going from the woods, cutting up the trees, making a lishtun, making this realization spring to the fore, then it will open up for all other philosophers and sciences we had. It's not very hard to understand. This will also help neurology. This will be evident in the course of this lecture series. I'll continue on page 107. It's not bad, actually. It's 107 pages. That in itself is... The closest that contemporary cosmology comes to exemplifying this idea has been in the loose allusion to multiple cosmogenesis in theories of eternal inflation. With no explicit account of variation of structures and regularities in the universes that would be generated by the multiple explosive events foreseen by eternal inflation. Moreover, if such universes existed, they would be better regarded as 
instant instances of succession. It is therefore unsurprising to find the idea of parallel universes to be a largely unoccupied position in contemporary cosmology. The influential contemporary representative of the idea of plurality is that of divergent universes, the multiverse. Each universe causally cut off at all times from all other universes has its own laws and its own organization at the level of its most elementary constituents. Each is a world unto itself. The conception of divergent universes has been proposed at least twice over the last 60 years. On each occasion, the alleged basis has been different. However, the theoretical motivation and logic in the two episodes have been strikingly and revealingly similar. In the 1950s, Hugh Everett intim intimated and John Wheeler more explicitly proposed the genesis of a multitude of universes out of quantum realities. Each outcome of a possible quantum state would exist in a different world. Thus, the underdetermination of quantum theory under the predominant Copenhagen interpretation would be redressed by a proliferation of worlds. Each of them enacting one of the otherwise unrealized quantum possibilities. What seemed to be under determination was reinterpreted by a theory that took every possible state of affairs to be real albeit somewhere else. In the closing decades of the 20th century, 
the chief impulse to postulate a vast numbers of universes came from string theory. And more generally, from the marriage of string theory in a cosmological setting to theories of eternal inflation and to anthropic thinking. To each of its mathematical possibilities, there was imagined to correspond a different vacuum state or universe. In fact, 10 to the 500 or more. This view in particle physics radically underdetermined nature as we observe it. in the cool down universe and fail to provide any criterion of selection among the states of affairs with which it was compatible. The problem was converted into a solution. The failure into an achievement. The conversion relied on the simple device of I can continue in the book. of imagining that each of the unobserved states of affairs was enacted in a different universe. How grand! Replete with its own distinctive structures and regularities, in conformity to one of the countless but not infinite variations admitted by the theory. The circle was closed with the appeal to anthropic reasoning The universe in which we find ourselves would be one of this crowd of universes. Its extraordinary improbable initial conditions and its fine-tuned properties and constants were to be explained retrospectively as the sole combination of features capable of having resulted in us, the human race, which discovers these truths. It's just excellent. The failure, the disaster becomes a triumph. And Max Tegmark and Hugh Everett got the benefits of that. They get a laureate on their heads. It was with the basis in this style of particle physics 
rather than in quantum mechanics, essentially the same line of reasoning that Everett had proposed a few decades before. However, it went further in radicalizing the attitude to mathematics as a prefiguring of natural reality. It went further as well in its deployment of retrospective anthropic rationalization as a proxy for causal accounts more canonical in the dominant tradition of physics. Much of the argument of this chapter is devoted to a criticism of the multiverse idea and to a development and defense of the thesis of the singular existence of the universe. Going back indefinitely in time, succession and transformation rather than plurality. There is, however, in a sense in which the idea of plurality in the form of divergent universes or a multiverse resembles the thesis of singular existence and succession. The multiverse idea in its contemporary form and in some of its more radical developments suggests a notion of regional laws of nature. Although there may be very general and fundamental laws marking the perimeter of alternative universes, the effective laws represent the distinctive regularities of each universe. They are regional rather than universal. They are in a sense determined by the environment rather than determining it. As the standard way of thinking in the physics inaugurated by Galileo and Newton would require their regional will be more salient the more we discount the power of mathematics to reveal and explain rather than simply to represent the variations of nature. The thesis of singular existence and of non-cyclic succession may be interpreted to apply to periods in history of the universe. 
or to successive universes, a similar idea of domain-specific laws. Similarly opposed to the idea of the universality of the regularities of nature. The idea of local laws or of laws specific to different universes has unwittingly prepared the ground for the rejection of the universality and constancy of the laws and other regularities of nature. There are, however, two differences of far-reaching consequence. The first difference is that for the thesis of singularity and succession, natural variation works through time. The weakening of the absolute character of the laws of nature is temporal rather than spatial. The conception of the reality of time becomes inseparable from the thesis of the singular existence of the universe. The laws and other regularities of nature are mutably features of the one real universe. The second difference. The second difference is that if we regard time as inclusively real, we cannot exempt either the regularities or the structures of nature from its reach. Neither the laws, symmetries and supposed constants of nature, nor its elementary constituents are permanent features of nature, moving and unmoved by bystanders to its history, untouched by reciprocated action. On this view, there are no laws and structures, no matter how fundamental, that fail to change sooner or later and that have not changed or emerged as the outcome of change in the past. Even the extent to which causality displays recurrent, law-like features may vary, marking some states of nature but not others. In such a universe, everything changes sooner or later, including change itself. Consider now the chief variance of the idea of singular existence of the universe. The universe may be solitary without predecessors or prior history. Before the fiery beginning that the standard cosmological model assigns to it, coming abruptly out of nothing.
alternatively the universe may have a history extending before the big bang inferred by that model to have taken place in the earliest moments of the history of the universe the reference to such a history is the thesis of succession which appears as a development of the idea of singular existence rather than as an alternative to it. We may picture this earlier history either as a succession of universes or as a succession of periods in the history of the one real universe. A preference for one of these vocabularies over the other is of little consequence if we allow that causal continuity between successive universes or between successive periods in the history of the one real universe to be stressed but never broken. To say that causal continuity remains unbroken is to signify that causal succession, the after shaped by the before, listen to that, the after shaped by the before, persists, persists without interruption even in such extreme circumstances. To say that it is stressed means that the distinction between laws and states of affairs may, in this extremity, break down and causal connections may cease to present in repetitious law-like form. That would be nature as a world of singular events the possibility of which is predicated on the view that causal connections are primitive feature of nature rather than instances or enactments of laws and symmetries. Consequently, it is also predicated on the idea that laws and symmetries are a mode of causality. The mode prevailing in the cooled down universe rather than the basis of causality and the warrants of causal explanations. There are in turn two main variants of the idea of succession, cyclic and non-cyclic. According to the cyclic view, the basic regularities of nature remain unchanged 
throughout the history of the universe or of successive universes. The structural forms of nature change, but in conformity to these unchanging regularities and in the recurrent stages. These stages remain identical in each iteration of the cycle. Despite the differences among proposals of a cyclic cosmology made over the course of the 20th century by Sodi, Tolman, Friedman, Sakharov, Rosenthal, Rosen and Israelit, Penrose, Steinhardt, Churok and others the cyclic view has retained across these variants a discernible entity and a characteristic arg argumentative strategy. According to the non-cyclic view, there is no unchanging feature of nature other than its susceptibility to changing change, which we call time. The non-cyclic view of succession forms an integral part of the temporal naturalism developed and defended in this book. The distinctive explanatory challenges faced by each of these three forms of the thesis of the singular existence of the universe, absolute beginning, cyclic succession and non-cyclic succession help elucidate the distinctions among them. The next section takes up the argument in favour of non-cyclic succession against the two other variants of the thesis of singular existence. That is absolute beginning and cyclic succession. And of course, as well as against the thesis of plurality. In contemporary cosmology, the idea of an absolute beginning by the initial in infinite singularity that as that a long line of 20th century cosmologists argue to be implied by the field equations of general relativity. It was, however, widely recognized, even by Einstein himself, that this inference rather than describing a physical state of affairs, reveal a breakdown of the theory when it was carried beyond. Its proper domain of application. More generally, as I argued, throughout and as many have recognized in the history of both physics and mathematics. The infinite that is invoked in this view is a mathematical conception with no presence in nature. As with the multiverse idea, the notion of an absolute beginning 
that tends to convert a limitation of insight into a conception of nature and its history. Moreover, to interpret the thesis of singular existence as if it required such an absolute beginning is to embrace the first horn of the antinomy of cosmogenesis. The emergence of something out of nothing. If we lift the screen of the mathematical idea of the infinite, illeg Ill illegitimately applied in cosmology, we are then faced with a choice between two accounts of absolute beginning. On one account, nothing is nothing. We impose an arbitrary cutoff of causation and time. implying that they emerge not of, of, not of something, but of nothing. On the alternative account, nothing is something. An unstable vacuum field, for example. Then, however, we are entitled indeed required to ask where this something comes from and what its earlier history before the Big Bang may be. We have then effectively abandoned the notion of an absolute beginning in a favor of the thesis of succession. The challenge faced by the thesis of an absolute beginning is thus to escape this available but unacceptable choices. It does not seem that it can do so. When we turn to the views of singularity that combine singularity with succession described either as a sequence of universes or as a sequence of periods in the history of the one real universe. The first problem that both the cyclic and the non-cyclic variants of succession must confront is their relation to the agenda of empirical science. Very important. Unlike both the causally disjoint universes of the multiverse conception and the infinite initial singularity that may be used to represent the idea of an absolute beginning both cyclic and non-cyclic variants of successions are in principle open to empirical research, if not directly, then indirectly by their signatures, vestiges or effects. However, it is not good enough to say that they are open to such research if they fail 
in the fact to be open to it and to help open it. By informing an agenda of investigation that cosmology can implement as its observational and experimental equipment becomes more powerful and its theoretical insight more acute. In the absence of such developments, the thesis of succession can be justly accused of being as speculative as the multiverse conception that it opposes. The presumption of causal continuity and temporal extension will not suffice to defend it against this accusation. Another difficulty that the idea of succession must confront in both its cyclic and non-cyclic varieties is the problem presented by the second horn of the antinomy of cosmogenesis. The cyclic or non-cyclic succession either has a beginning or it does not. If it has a beginning further back in time than the exclusive inception of our present universe that is pictured by the standard cosmological model we face once again the problems of absolute beginning. Having only pushed them into the past. If it has no beginning, the universe as a succession of periods or of universes is eternal. We shall then have reintroduced with regard to time the infinity that we rejected in other departments of our cosmological thinking. The reasons to regard time as, unlike space, non-emergent, may seem to provide grounds to accept time as eternity from the rule against the banishment of infinite from the nature and from science. The adoption of the thesis of the eternity of the world, however, is neither a necessary consequence of the view of time as non-emergent, nor easy to reconcile with the rule against infinity. It is more appropriate to the spirit of self-denying ordinance in space, relinquishing metaphysical and theological pretense the better to claim and to exercise other powers.
to assume that the universe or succession of universes extends indefinitely back into the past. Cosmology, at least in its present condition, with its present insights and instrument, instruments, is not entitled to describe the world as either eternal or as emergent from an absolute beginning. Time may be held to be non-emergent because there may be nothing more than may be nothing more fundamental than it and nothing from which it derives. I do like this. Without it being the case that we have any basis other than the rejection of making something out of nothing. To describe it as eternal A third challenge with which the idea of succession in both its cyclic and non-cyclic version must deal must deal is its apparent contradiction to the now predominant interpretations of general relativity. These interpretations with their insistence on many finger time, that treatment of space-time continuum as central and indispensable aspect of general relativity and their approach to time as a derivative feature of the disposition of matter and motion in the universe exclude the possibility of a cosmic or global time that is also preferred. The sense in which I use cosmic time here. They permit only the choice of space-time coordinates that are cosmic in the sense that they cover the whole universe but that are not preferred. The choice of any such space-time coordinate remains arbitrary from the standpoint of theory. So theory cannot explain time, never, ever. It's nonsensical to claim that we can explain what time is. Nota bene, this is not the same conclusion as Newton came to. A preferred cosmic time allows every event in history of the universe, universe or of successive universes to be, to be placed. In principle, on a single timeline, it is hard to see how we can make sense of the idea of succession and thus of the singular existence of the universe without appealing to preferred 
cosmic time. A concern of chapter four is to discuss the reasons for which and the manner in which we can reinterpret the empirical hardcore of general relativity to allow for the existence of such time required by the thesis of succession. The cyclic version of this thesis faces thesis faces in addition to these general challenges to all variants of succession a further difficulty. This version affirms the continuity of both the basic structure of nature recurring in particular stages and the regularities of nature which account for such persistence and recurrence. In so doing it allows part of nature, its fundamental constituents and regularities to remain outside the reach of temporal change and reciprocated action. We have reason to think, I later argue, that nothing remains outside that reach. I think I am there at page 115. Put a very, very small rock there, I will not. So, this is incredibly, it is like reading a, an incredible detective story. Once you get your interest up for this, it becomes more and more exclusive. It is really dynamite. And to this moment, page 115, not a single mathematical term has been mentioned. I'm actually not pointing to what we regularly call physics. Isn't this extraordinary? This is the way how to explain physics or quantum mechanics for lay people. I say thank you very much. Thank you for your extraordinary patience and have a wonderful afternoon.